Thank you for joining us for another Hagley History Hangout. My name is Gregory Hargreaves, Assistant Director of the Center for the History of Business, Technology, and Society at the Hagley Museum and Library in Wilmington, Delaware. Now, you know, during these History Hangouts, we like to bring you some of the great work being done by folks who have used the historical collections held in the Hagley Library, especially scholars who have received support from the Hagley Center in the form of research grants and fellowships of different kinds. One such scholar joins me today. Dr. Dr. Anna Andrzejewski is Professor of Art History at the University of Wisconsin at Madison and to the current NEH Hagley Fellow in the Hagley Center. Anna, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Let's start by painting with broad strokes. What is it that you're researching and writing about? Well, I'm writing a uh, history of sorts of Florida vacation and retirement communities built after World War II. Uh, the project really seeks to bring architecture uh, and the broader landscape uh, into conversation with histories of Florida tourism uh, for the most part. So I'm an architectural historian by training uh, and for uh, my whole life actually, even though I haven't uh, spent a lot of time in Florida, I've been intrigued um, by the sort of tourist landscape and how that came to be. So this project is an attempt uh, to really try to get into understanding why that landscape looks the way it does and the many different players uh, that contributed to the making of that place. Could you perhaps describe this landscape a little bit uh, for folks who haven't either been to South Florida or looked at the satellite imagery, which is really quite dramatic? Sure. So um, in a broad sense, I, I, some of us know it, uh, know Florida probably through Disney. Um, and some of it uh, is that in the sense that it is what I define and talk about as a landscape of leisure. But in South Florida in particular, what is, what is really intriguing is uh, the fact that it's made up of uh, what I would call suburban uh, neighborhoods, especially along the coasts. And even when we think about high rises and, and we might uh, think about um, certainly uh, places near Miami and some of the high rises, it's still suburban in the sense that uh, there are these places that are gated uh, in large part, controlled um, and removed largely from uh, what we would think of as urbanity. So mm. um, a lot of it, especially on the Gulf Coast, if you think about St. Petersburg and South, uh, are sort of your traditional suburban landscape of sort of single family detached dwellings, um, sort of, you know, well removed, if you will, from urban centers. But even in places like Miami and Fort Lauderdale, there's there's a suburban character, uh, even though we we see things that don't look conventionally uh, suburban. So when we think about it, it's it's uh, largely residential, uh, except for commercial functions, supplemented by things we associate with leisure, things like parks or in Florida, beaches, um, and other sorts of golf courses and, and other sorts of leisure features that we associate with uh, the suburbs for the most part. I suppose another really defining characteristic of the suburban landscape is car dependency. How, does that factor in here as well? It does, although it's a little bit different than what we think about when we think of suburbs in a sort of Levittown, uh, New York sense. People mm -hmm. always talk about uh, post-war suburbia associated with uh, the Levittowns of New York uh, and Pennsylvania. Car dependency, certainly to get to these places in South Florida is absolutely necessary. Um, but this is also one of the distinguishing features that I talk about in my project associated with South Florida and these places a regional kind of suburbanization that is less car dependent once you're there. Hmm. So a lot of these communities um, were built for 55 plus, uh, what we think of as uh, sort of the retirement village model. And indeed, some of the earliest retirement villages uh, were built in Florida in the 1950s. Um, once there, uh, you have everything you need. You have your golf course, you have your park, you have your uh, sort of provisional grocery store uh, that you get to by your golf cart today uh, or walked back in the 1950s. And so they were they were designed uh, to be sort of self-contained communities. And I see this again and again when I'm looking through builders and real estate developers papers that they wanted them to be self-contained. So yes, car dependent to get there, but these places were for full-time leisure, not for uh, working and commuting to work. Um, and, and that accounts for their sort of regionally distinct uh, uh, sort of character. 
mm. um, and being less dependent on the car. Mm. So uh, could you perhaps give us the narrative arc of your study? Um, I understand that tens of millions of people have moved to Florida over the period that you're discussing in this sense, World War II. Um, so what what is the, the narrative arc? Where did this, um, uh, this landscape come from and, and how did it uh, arrive at its current configuration? Sure. So there's a lot of uh, reasons sort of lying behind uh, what's, what happened after World War II. And we, you know, some of it has to do with sort of the growth of the sun melt more broadly. Um, but sort of the arc of the book uh, really looks at sort of the explosion after uh, World War II that was a combination uh, of the result of um, a new growth of retirement and vacation benefits, uh, which uh, really came to uh, benefit more Americans, if you will, uh, in the 20th century, and especially after World War II uh, with retirement. Um, it also looks at the growth of um, big real estate development uh, and builders being a factor in this. Um, and then it also looks at sort of suburbanization as I just defined it. So the book sort of traces it and it, it does not go sort of entity by entity. So it doesn't sort of look at um, real estate developers in a chapter and then retirement and vacation benefits in a chapter. Instead, it interweaves this through looking uh, at different elements of the built environment. So the book really looks um, in a scalar way, beginning with sort of the Florida house, the tropical house as a distinct mm -hmm. regional type then broadens out to look at, uh, in the next chapter, suburban developments and communities at sort of a community scale. Then it looks to the broader sort of uh, landscape itself, uh, taking uh, into account the ways in which the natural world was uh, quote unquote improved uh, to make these places possible. Then there's a chapter on how this was advertised uh, to the nation really uh, as America's playground. And then the book closes um, by looking at um, moving from the promotional aspect, looking at the reality of what these places were like to be lived and how in fact it was a uh, deeply sort of segregated white middle-class landscape uh, as it came to be over the course of the 1950s and 1960s. And I tried to conclude the book by looking at that against the backdrop of desegregation uh, in Florida, for example, uh, and the civil rights movement, uh, which had uh, particular impacts in Florida. So uh, the arc of the book really sort of looks uh, across different elements of the landscape and moves from sort of an ideal to the reality of what it was like to live in this place. Uh, I really, really like that um, organization that you've got going. Um, it, I can already imagine uh, reading the book, uh, so I'm <laughs> getting very excited. Um, well, who are some of your actors? I know you've mentioned uh, builders in particular. Could we perhaps talk about uh, building and development um, and, and some of those actors and the roles they play? Sure. <laughs> this is where I can talk forever. So <laughs> one of the the actors that I really sought to bring into this, and it's actually how I got into the project, um, are, are uh, builders and real estate developers. And the project began when I encountered a private archive associated with um, uh, the Mackle Company of Miami. They were actually the biggest builders in the nation uh, in 1958 and 1959. Um, and their archive, uh, or a good percentage of it, is actually still held privately by uh, Frank Meckel III, who is a descendant uh, of one of the brothers that built this uh, major building firm. Uh, and I discovered this archive quite by accident, uh, cold calling, uh, in fact. Oh, wow. um, and it's really an incredible um, treasure trove that uh, the descendants have given me access to um, that has allowed me to uh, sort of really see in an insider sort of way uh, the ways in which um, builders and developers viewed South Florida as, as a kind of blank slate for them to uh, develop these large uh, communities. And the Mackles built uh, on both coasts of Florida uh, in the 1950s and 1960s. And, and their narrative is woven throughout um, all of the chapters of the book, but it's not just them. And I'm, I'm really fortunate uh, that I've uh, been able to make contact with other uh, descendants of some of these builders including a smaller builder that worked not on both coasts of Florida, but in the St. Petersburg area in the 1950s. Uh, and that is James Rosati. Uh, and I've been working uh, with 
uh, his grandson uh, for some mm. time uh, with their private archive. Mm. Uh, and then uh, recently I um, also caught, was uh, on Facebook of all things, uh, reading through some Florida posts, um, able to connect with another prominent uh, uh, family of uh, builders and developers in the Miami area. So um, that is certainly a, a source or a, a group of sources that I, I tap uh, throughout the different chapters um, of the book. And although it deals, you know, certainly those materials figure most prominently in the chapters on uh, the house, the Florida house, uh, as well as the chapters on advertising, um, it, it really does weave throughout uh, all of the different chapters uh, of the book. So I'm, I'm really excited uh, to bring this material to light, and most of it hasn't been seen uh, before. Yeah, that's the the thrill and the excitement of the the hunt and the discovery, yes. as it were. <laughs> Um, could you perhaps describe a little bit more about this um, notion of a blank slate? If I think um, sort of about the different regional characteristics of the United States, South Florida actually strikes me as one of the most distinctive uh, natural environments, um, the, the least blank slate of all, uh, you might say. So how is it that these builders are approaching it as if it were a blank slate? Is that merely wishful thinking or uh, what, what was their thought there? So it's it's really interesting, and and actually in the last uh, week or so after returning from uh, a, an archival visit to the State Archives of Florida, I've been thinking about this a lot because um, when uh, one of the these uh, families of builders, the Mackles that I mentioned before, were developing Marco Island, which is located on the Gulf Coast south of Naples, in the mid nineteen sixties, uh, they announced that they were. Um, basically building in Flor in uh, Florida's last frontier. And they actually talked about it uh, in, in these frontier terms, which I think is really interesting. Mm -hmm. And built on the uh, sort of Western edge, Northwestern edge really of Everglades National Park. I mean, Marco Island really was at the time um, unsettled in a colonial sense, meaning there were, there were a few uh, settlers and seasonal vis visitors, mainly uh, fishermen, um, but for the most part, because of its swampy character, the fact that much of it was below sea level, uh, it wasn't um, sort of widely settled by white settlers um, in even as late as the mid 20th century. And so it, in many ways, it was this kind of, um, in, in terms that uh, we think about it today, empty, so to speak, but it wasn't empty at all, of course, and we know that. And one of the things that, that uh, I try to bring in, uh, particularly in the chapter, where I look at uh, some of these changes to this so-called so blank slate as they viewed it. Um, I try to look at uh, indigenous uh, populations that were living in South Florida. And this included certainly the Calusa Indians who go back centuries. Um, they were largely pushed out during the colonial period, but it was the Seminoles uh, that were forced uh, ever further South hmm. uh, in the 19th century and eventually took up uh, occupation in uh, the region we know as the Everglades today. Uh, and there's there's um, different sort of uh, groups associated with that today. The McCuskey uh, is one of those tribes, but certainly um, they were there. So it wasn't truly a blank slate, um, but it was sparsely settled and hard to live there uh, in a permanent sense and hard to make it inhabitable, particularly in the terms that developers like the Mackles wanted. Uh, mm. to develop, you know, where we're talking about these modern communities with golf courses, and leisure amenities that need to be above sea level, so to speak. So um, it, it's really interesting uh, to think about this sort of idea of a blank slate. I would add one other thing, which is that um, that was 1964 when the Mackles were uh, building on America's last frontier, uh, Florida's last frontier, as they termed it. Um, but it's language that goes back into the 19th century uh, when some of the first uh, sort of East Coast railroad barons like uh, Henry Plant and Henry Flagler were uh, bring, building their lines down both coasts of Florida. They were using that same language as well, mm. the language of the unsettled frontier. So it's in many ways a sort of rhetorical move, I think, that um, the Mackles were making in the 1960s to follow in the footsteps of those before them. Mm. That's very interesting, and of course, requires an enormous amount of replumbing. Uh, it's the waterscape that gets um, perhaps most used and abused when it comes to developing South Florida. Could you perhaps um, uh, explore that a little bit? Um, what what 
was uh, what did they do with the waterscape? Uh, of course, um, trying to drain parts, uh, and but also keeping water around because um, waterfront real estate, of course, has a premium price tag. So uh, I, I'm thinking of maps where every other development has a ditch dug through it so that right. uh, to create waterfront housing, as it were. Um, could, could you perhaps talk about the waterscape a bit? Absolutely. Well, this is one of the things that really uh, got me thinking about this as a book project. Actually, if you look at an aerial um, map uh, of Florida, the coast of South Florida today, you see all of these um, strange canal uh, looking uh, areas. Uh, they were named um, finger canals in the 1950s because mm -hmm. they create um, uh, sort of uh, peninsulas of land that look like fingers. Um, and so they've hence the name finger canals. Um, it also, for developers, they started calling uh, the practice of dredging and filling uh, the sort of uh, waterscape down there. They, they uh, talked about it as, as finger fills because they would dredge the bottom of the, the water courses and the harbors. And then what they dredged became fill for these uh, fingered settlements, uh, as they're called. This was widespread. Uh, in Florida as in the 1950s, as developers just uh, took advantage of the fact that there were no, uh, there was no regulation, uh, so to speak, on this. And in fact, um, another player, another actor in my book that I talk about um, is uh, Florida's Internal Improvement Fund, uh, which essentially managed, so to speak, submerged lands, among other things, in the 1950s. Um, developers could petition the IIF, as it was known, uh, to purchase submerged lands uh, on which they could dredge and fill and create additional waterfront lots, mm -hmm. so to speak. So literally, they were buying up, developers were buying up parts of Boca Ciega Bay and Tampa Bay, uh, which they would dredge and fill. They could purchase that land from the state, basically water, and create new waterfront lots, so to speak. So. Oh. This just speaks uh, of the degree of engineering that was going on uh, in the Florida landscape that people probably don't know about. Certainly, uh, there were concerns, especially in a place like Marco Island, which was really almost as far south as, as one could get without going into Everglades National Park. Um, there was a shortage of fresh water. They had to pipe that in to make that development sustainable. And then they had to take the pollutants, the sewage out, so to speak. Um, they had, they eventually built uh, a water treatment plant there, but um, as Marco was developed over the course of the 1960s and into the 1970s, uh, and environmental regulations, the Clean Water Act uh, of 1972, for example, uh, the developers had to face uh, consequences for this. They had to defend their actions, um, and it eventually certainly caused problems. So there were many ways that uh, water and water politics uh, uh, sort of were um occurring throughout Florida, and certainly it plays a major role uh, uh, in the book that I'm writing. Mm -hmm. And uh, over the long-term history, it, it's one of the key um, factors undermining the long-term sustainability of many of these developments. Um, as we have uh, saltwater infiltration of the aquifer um, and all kinds of problems just have, that have compounded as a result of this um, poorly planned, not planned at all, really a uh, replumbing of the Florida waterscape. Yeah, I mean, the story of, of uh, water in Florida, and there's there's uh, an excellent um, book on this, The Swamp, written, goodness, over a decade ago now, I guess, um, that really deals with some of the, the, the efforts, the past efforts to control water um, in the Everglades. Uh, it's really interesting, I think, um, to think about what I'm doing within the context of that broader history. Um, and because it's really the story of settling, especially the southern half of the state, like Okeechobee and South has really been about water uh, in a lot of ways. And it's it's important to consider not just the engineering aspects of that and sort of the environmental history, but how this is tied to the cultural landscape, which is what I'm trying to do in part mm -hmm. of my book. Well, who are these folks who were attracted to Florida? Where were they coming from? What sort of social backgrounds um, uh, were they coming from? That's really fascinating and that changes uh, over the course of the 20th century. And as I said earlier, my book focuses on the post-World War II period when we really see an expansion uh, in terms of the audiences 
uh, that could uh, afford to, uh, both in terms of time and money, uh, come to Florida. Uh, that began actually in the 1930s. Um, and uh, the, the first chapter of my book sort of talks about the lead up to this period. Um, through the 19th century and into the early 20th century is largely what uh, Thorsten Bedlin and others have termed the leisured class who could afford to go to Florida resorts, uh, mainly along the East Coast, although also St. Petersburg and that area. Um, the Newport of the South, uh, actually, as Palm Beach was once called. Um, uh, mm -hmm. But that all changed in the 20th century, and especially after World War II, when an increased number of Americans uh, could afford uh, to take a vacation uh, or uh, perhaps have a second home uh, or move to a place like Florida uh, in retirement. When you ask who actually moved there, uh, it was largely, uh, not surprisingly, perhaps geographically, east of the Rockies, uh, and especially the urban northeast and Midwest. And developers uh, knew this. Uh, they advertised um, in uh, urban markets in the northeast and upper Midwest. Uh, and so you see them not only setting up sales booths uh, in public areas in the urban Northeast and Midwest, but you also see them uh, advertising in newspapers, building model homes. One of my uh, builders built a model home in Queens, New York, uh, mm. that he uh, would truck up palm trees every year uh, to make it look more <laughs> Florida-like, I guess. Another developer had a model home built uh, in a department store in Chicago, um, in January, not surprisingly, to uh, attract people to go to Florida. Um, I think one of the more interesting aspects is the state's role in this, and I'm untangling mm -hmm. this right now, uh, partly uh, through use of the Margulies collection uh, at Hagley, um, because uh, the state um, also supported this, the various commissions, I won't get into the nuances of it, uh, within the state of Florida advertising commissions, et cetera, um, they made it pretty clear that they wanted uh, a certain kind of person to move to Florida. Um, and this was not only apparent with uh, sort of the amenities they described, which were quintessentially suburban and middle class um, in the pictures that they had of mm -hmm. uh, largely Caucasian Americans, you know, gallivanting in the sun. Um, but also in some of the language that they used, which uh, did warn people that if you couldn't make it on the same income that you had in the North, uh, you couldn't make it in Florida. So it was a bit restrictive in the sense that they, they courted and supported um, people moving to Florida if they could afford it. Mm -hmm. um, retirees, there was great anxiety about the influx of retired adults to Florida in the 1940s, late 1940s and early 1950s. And there was a, a retirement research division set up within state government that studied these retirees mm -hmm. and uh, was greatly concerned about what one person in the division termed the riffraff that was coming uh, down to Florida, thinking they could make it on a pension and discovering that they actually couldn't. Mm -hmm. So it was, um, sort of open to anyone that could uh, afford it. And at the same time, there was language in there that uh, was restrictive. And it, it's pretty interesting to think about this in light of some of the concerns about so-called immigration in Florida today um, under uh, current governor Ron DeSantis, where you know it's like Florida's uh, welcome, you know, we welcome everyone, but not everyone really. Um, I'm, I'm just mm -hmm. reminded of that as I'm looking through these materials uh, in the Margulies collection at Hagley. Yeah. Well, I, it does make me wonder, um, what are some of the social and political consequences of this where an entire state full of gated communities, where these barriers have been raised to selectively um, court um, certain people, white moderately wealthy people to come. Um, what what are then the, the consequences of an entire state that has been built upon this premise? Well, it's really interesting because I think when I um, began working on this, this book, I mean, this was really what I wanted to think about was how this exclusionary landscape um, really was set up and, and, and what its impact was. And I would argue that, that it's, it's architecture um, and landscape design really um, makes and defines this landscape and shapes the way it works in certain ways. It's obviously, and you mentioned the gated aspect of it, which for the most part came later, um, mm -hmm. but it does create and ex 
exclusionary uh, sort of presence in the state that is, that is very, very palpable. And it has a history, which is interesting. Um, you know, when the developers that I'm working on were building in the 1950s, they basically racially restrictive covenants had been outlawed, um, but they didn't need them. <laughs> and I've had several descendants of builders tell me this. We didn't need them because, you know, the people we we're attracting, you know, that came here, uh, it was sort of self-selected, so to speak. Mm. But if we think about that, and we think about certainly the labor force that was sustaining these communities that helped build them uh, for the most part, they were increasingly uh, sort of relegated, if you will, to urban areas of St. Petersburg and Miami. Uh, mm -hmm. So African-American uh, sorts of sort of regions. Eventually we talk about sort of the Cuban American influx into Miami in the late fifties and certainly after Castro. Um, but uh, for the most part, um, it was a it was a sort of what I talk about in the book as kind of a hyper segregated landscape in the fifties mm -hmm. and sixties. And architecture worked to enforce this even in the absence of legal sorts of st structures. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's just sort of as as my builders say, well, it just worked that way. Um, they get very defensive when I talk about um, racially restrictive covenants, but they didn't need them, so to speak. So it. It sets up this um, this landscape of segregation that I, I try to show in the book that architecture helps um, enforce. Mm -hmm. And this has a long history in Florida. And again, referring to the Margulies collection at, at Hagley, I, it, it was just a, a sort of amazing um, kind of discovery as I was going through that material to sort of see the ways in which um, the earliest sort of leisured landscapes were segregated in that period, whether it's sort of what Flagler was building at Palm Beach um, and uh, or what we talk about Carl Fisher and the growth of Miami Beach in the 20s and 30s, which was exceptionally exclusive, prohibited, for example, uh, Jews from uh, occupying anything but the small sort of uh, quarter of um, the southern part of Miami Beach. You know, if you were Jewish, you could not stay at one of Fisher's hotels. Um, and so a lot of what I'm seeing after World War II with this sort of segregated and, and elite landscape has its roots earlier. And, and going through the Margulies collection and seeing in the ephemera, the advertising ephemera, both the private interests and the state, uh, you could sort of see how that took shape uh, leading up to World War II. Hmm. Do you think your builders, your actors um, in the mid-century could have uh, anticipated Florida being as nationally prominent as it is today? That's a great question and one that um, I have I, I, I sort of asked myself um, from time to time, if you listen to their rhetoric, sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> in reality, I don't think they saw um, probably the scale uh, that it would be today. Um, it, it, you know, they talk about this, this gigantic movement and, and everything, but again, it was just not I don't think that folks like the Mackles, you know, again, the biggest builder in the country in 58 and 59, um, I just don't think they saw it beyond their own developments sort of taking mm -hmm. off. They were just one of, you know, many large scale developers in that period. And so um, I think when the Mackles went to Marco Island, this last frontier, so to speak, I, I don't think that they expected that the area between Marco Island and Naples 10 miles north would be filled in, for example. Yeah. <laughs> um, so they, they knew that people would come to Florida, but not on, to that scale. I don't think, mm -hmm. I don't think anybody envisioned that. And they certainly, um, didn't anticipate the, uh, sort of environmental consequences, uh, of, of their actions. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering whether your study has any implications for the present day. Another question I ask myself a lot <laughs> of the time. Um, the way that I work is that I, I have, and this is throughout my career, I look at something um, that uh, jostles my interests as a sort of, I, 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 I joke with a colleague at uh, Madison that we want to teach a course called Why Florida Happened. Um, <laughs> and it's true. I mean, I, I, I'm not a native Floridian. Uh, I actually haven't spent that much time in Florida, but 
uh, for my first visit there um, as a child through the visits in my adult years, I was just super intrigued by um, what we might talk about as overdevelopment. Mm. Um, and then, you know, as a young adult, um, you know, with the hanging chads, <laughs> the, the 2000 election, for example, like, I just started thinking about it. And Florida's role in elections um, has always sort of intrigued me, uh, piqued by something someone said that, you know, Florida's um, electorate changes every four years because quite frankly, people people die and new people move in and it's mm -hmm. just sort of this ever-changing target. So in terms of consequences of this, this study, I, I actually think it does um, have bearing on um, a lot of what's going on in Florida today, particularly the fact that it is a transplanted population that does cycle all the time. And I think mm -hmm. thinking about mobility, uh, age, race, and class as a factor, um, which is what my book does, uh, really does have ramifications um, for the election today. I also really think that um, the emphasis on uh, movement migration in migration in the state, um, which uh, Governor DeSantis keeps <laughs> really talking about. And of course, he's talking about immigration from outside the United States for the most part, and specifically illegal immigration. But in his words, I, I think about um, sort of tensions about how much can Florida take in mm -hmm. terms of population uh, mm -hmm. influxes. And, you know, clearly uh, the governor's move against Disney, uh, you know, which is pop probably going to uh, affect the economy of the state, to put it mildly. Um, you know, I, it, there is this question in my mind, and my book uh, is about this, is, is, you know, how much can this one place absorb uh, in terms of population? And finally, I would uh, add by saying, I really do want my book to speak to uh, sort of the unsustainability of this landscape. The places that I'm looking at are along the coast many uh, of the developments that I'm looking at are below sea level, uh, even inward sites in Miami. And so um, while the houses in many of these developments, these concrete block, tiny uh, little things um, are not terribly uh, distinctive as architecture, um, they do represent an important time period that is not gonna be around for much longer. And so I think my study does speak to that and, and really uh, gets us to think a little bit about um, our interest in these uh, waterfront so-called communities um, and how unsustainable this is in an era of climate change. Mm -hmm. Well, Anna, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me and to share your work. It's genuinely fascinating and I can't wait for the book. Thanks so much. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about it. Oh, sure. And for the audience, if you would like more Hagley History Hangouts and more information on the Center for the History of Business, Technology, and Society at the Hagley Museum and Library, join us online. You can go to hagley.org. That's H-A-G-L-E-Y dot O-R-G. Don't be a stranger. <laughs>